Okay, welcome everyone. Good evening to everyone here in the US and good morning to everyone tuning in from Japan. My name is Lisa Goldenberg from Japan Society here in New York City. I wanna thank everyone for joining us for this special event. Let's play two baseball in Japan and the US which is part of Japan Society's Passing the Torch series, uh, a celebration of the Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympics and the resiliency of athletes. Uh, first of all, I just want to thank tonight's program partners, Japan America Society of Dallas-Fort Worth, Japan America Society of Greater Cincinnati, Japan America Society of Chicago, and the Japan America Society of Kentucky for all their help getting this off the ground and for their support in promoting the event. Um, just to let all of the audience members know that after the moderated discussion, there will be an audience Q&A. So please pop your questions into the chat box during the event and we'll select some to ask the panelists at the end of the event. Um, there's also gonna be an event survey in the chat box. So after the event, please take a moment and fill that out. Um, your feedback really helps us um, in programming events that you all want to see. Um, tonight's event, we're going to be discussing baseball, which is the national pastime in both Japan and the US. Um, you know, it's the all star break, it's going to be featured in the Tokyo 2020 Summer Olympics uh, for the first time since 2008. And next year is going to be the 150th anniversary of baseball in Japan. So I think this is a timely event. We're going to focus on the differences in the game in both countries, the popularity of the sport the experience of Americans, you know, living in Japan and playing for teams in Japan versus playing with MLB teams in the US. Um, so I'm thrilled to be able to introduce tonight's esteemed participants. Um, first of all, I'm happy to present Warren Cromarty. He's also known as Crow. He played with the Montreal Expos before signing with the Tokyo Yomiuri Giants, uh, where he was managed by the legendary Sadahiro Oh. He went on to win the 1989 NPB MVP award. He's a co-author along with Robert Whiting of his autobiography, Slugging It Out in Japan, an American major leaguer in the Tokyo outfield. He worked as a broadcaster with the Florida Marlins. He's coached and managed in Miami and Japan. And he has a new book called One Move, The Ultimate Hitting Lesson, which is in, uh, out in Amazon Japan right now and hopefully coming to the US soon as well. Um, I'd also like to introduce Leon Lee. He played baseball for seven years in the US with the St. Louis Cardinals. He went out to play for 10 years in Japan with the Latte Orions, the Yokohama Taiyo Whales, and the Yakult Swallows. He went on to become the first African-American manager in Japan in 2003 for the Oryx Blue Wave. He worked as a hitting instructor for the Montreal Expos. He was a director of Pacific Rim operations for the Chicago Cubs. And he has a podcast titled Talking Baseball with Leon Lee. And he's the founder of an organization called Dream Alive Vision, which he sees as the ultimate opportunity to create an economic balance in disadvantaged and underserved communities across the US. Um, these are like amazing accomplishments. Um, I, I feel like I'm really abbreviating everyone's uh, biography, but next up, Matt Merton. He played as an outfielder for 14 years in the MLB and NPB combined for the Colorado Rockies, the Oakland Athletics, and the Chicago Cubs. Um, he signed with the Hanshin Tigers and was there from 2010 to 2015. And in 2010, he was the NPB single sit hit record breaker. He was a seven-time All-Star, a four-time Best Nine Award winner for the NPB. Um, he completed his playing career in 2017, and he worked for the front office for the Chicago Cubs. He's currently an assistant coach at GCA in Franklin, Tennessee, and he also works with various nonprofit organizations in Japan, trying to strengthen U.S.-Japan relations, and he's also working on establishing his own nonprofit in Japan. And finally, Robert Whiting, um, who everyone here probably knows very well from all the amazing books that he's written. He's a journalist and author. He's lived in Tokyo on and off for more than half a century. He's one of the only Western writers to have a regular newspaper column in Japanese. And he's written several highly su successful books on Japan on topics ranging from sports, Tokyo nightlife and crime, including You Gotta Have Wa, which is on baseball in Japan, Tokyo Underworld, and his latest release is a memoir titled Tokyo Junkie, which is now out in bookstores. And finally, I'm introducing tonight's moderator, Yuriko Romer. Her upcoming film, Diamond Diplomacy, explores the relationship between the US and Japan through a shared love of baseball. 
Uh, Yuriko also directed and produced the only documentary about Keiko Fukuda, the first woman to attain 10th degree black belt in judo, titled Mrs. Judo, uh, which won several prestigious film awards. And I'm happy now to be able to hand the program over to Yuriko. Okay, well, I thought we should uh, begin our conversation by acknowledging the upcoming Tokyo Olympics, which had has had some very major, major challenges over the last year, but is opening in nine days. So let's begin with Bob Whiting. Um, since this event was timed to coincide with the Olympics and because I've been reading Tokyo Junkie, which is your latest book, I'd like to start with your thoughts about the upcoming Tokyo games and how it relates to the 1964 games. In 1964, the Tokyo Olympics was seen as a post-war debut of Japan to the, to the world. Can you give us your thoughts on, and some perspectives on the upcoming 2020-2021 Olympic Games and how it relates to Japan and the world? Bob? Well, there's no comparison to 1964. You had the, <clears throat> the, the Tokyo Olympic Games are, are, the city has been called by historians as having undergone the greatest urban transformation in history. The city had no, uh, when they got the bid in 1958, the city had no infrastructure to speak of. Uh, only one five-star hotel and no building over 10 stories. In the span of uh, six years, they put, they put up 10,000 new buildings, eight overhead expressways, two subway lines, a monorail from Haneda Airport into the center of the city and uh, uh, the world's fastest train, the bullet train from Tokyo to Osaka in three, three hours. And so overnight, Tokyo, it's seemingly overnight, Tokyo was transformed into this high-tech megalopolis that was so impressive, tourism spiked in the James Bond crew filmed the movie, You Only Live Twice in Tokyo. And uh, now there's no transformation exactly. Most people don't know uh, about the changes that have been made in the past four years. There have been 45 you know, skyscrapers going up and the city's become quite modern. The Rainbow Bridge went up and you can stand at the Rainbow Bridge and look at the the Tokyo cityscape, and it's as beautiful as anywhere in the world, including Sydney and Manhattan. But unfortunately, spectators are not allowed to come in, no tourists. Uh, <clears throat> in 64, the city was flooded with tourists everywhere. There were interpre interpreters on every corner, sponsored by the government, waiting to help out. But here the streets are, you know, basically empty. The, the athletes have to live in a bubble. The journalists that came from abroad to cover them have to live in a bubble. They're not allowed to go out. So it's a really subdued thing. There only be, there might be the emperor and IOC chief Bach and the prime minister of Japan and the stands and a couple of others. So it's a pretty disappointing uh, affair. The fact that they're doing it at all, I guess, is a major achievement, given that the, the city of Tokyo is in a state of emergency now. Sorry, long answer. <laughs> okay, we want to hear about this. Um, so in the upcoming games, which itself has been filled with a lot of sort of background drama, um, baseball makes a comeback. And it hasn't been a part of the baseball hasn't been a part of the Olympics since 2008. So mentioning two facts, Japan will pause the MPB season for the Olympics, but the U.S. will not pause MLB for the Olympics. So I am curious about your thoughts, um, everyone's thoughts about all this. And also, I, you know, I want to bring up the sort of general internationality of baseball. So if you, if you all have any um, thoughts about baseball as an international sport, because it's, it's trying to become more and more of an international sport. Um, I also want to bring up that, so MLB is, is having this thing called the World Baseball Classic, and they have put a lot more energy and effort into it. And in fact, the Team USA won the World Baseball Classic Championship last time it was run. And, and then um, 
we have some recent news that is really kind of upsetting, but there were some comments made by Stephen Smith on ESPN about um, Shohei Otani and about how he, he, the headliner shouldn't have to be speaking with an interpreter. And um, I'm just going to go back a little bit into a few years. So I met Philip Alou a couple of years back and in his book and in his experience, he talked about being on the Giants and Alvin Dark was the manager and the Alou brothers had been asked not to speak Spanish to each other. And this is sort of, you know, we're going back like over half a century to that incident. And now all of a sudden Stephen Smith is making these comments about Otani not being able to speak English. So I know that was kind of a, a big background statement, but um, I would like to talk to the internationality of baseball. And I know you've all had your experiences of that. So I don't know, someone have want to start with that? Well, let me, let me kick this thing off here after playing in Japan uh, for seven years. And I'm still living in, in Tokyo right now through all this uh, Corona uh, situation and seeing, seeing different uh, things along the way. Look, uh, the, as far as the international scene, as far as um, uh, baseball not being played for since 2008, it's going to be played again this year. This is uh, baseball is the DNA here in Japan, next to sumo. So it's, it's sacrilegious as far as uh, what people come out to have entertained and they love the sport. They took, they took the sport and they absolutely love the sport. They're dedicated. Actually, I think they're more dedicated to the game of baseball, certainly the fans than some of the American counterparts. I don't know if that's going to get me in trouble, but that's what I see. I've only talked for what I know. And um and I think in France, uh, I think France is going to have it after this. It's not going to be any baseball there until it happens. A real world series, because I don't think Major League Baseball is ever going to take their players off uh, to play in Olympics, especially with all the money that is involved now with television rights and players under these huge contracts. Can't take the opportunity of somebody getting hurt. It's, it's just the game has changed. It's all about the dollar right now. So. Uh, I don't think there's going to be a real world series until something comes along say we can stop major league baseball. We can stop for two, two weeks. You're talking season ticket holders, television. It's just too much going on here. But when the WBC comes along, there's that unity and baseball has this tremendous uh, uh, thing about transcending. And you saw the Babe Ruth clip, how baseball brought the team over there in Japan and played in Japan and, you know, and Stephen A. Smith is saying the comments that he made. And I'm only talking for myself and Leon and Mac and Chip in here also. When you're in a foreign country, you don't know the language, whatever, that you're trying to do. That's the first thing you try to try to do as a as a worker or as a, uh, a foreign person coming in to Japan. My whole initial thing was coming to Japan is trying to make sure my teammates knew that I was I want to be like them. And I, and I want people who are listening to this, if you're working in another environment or another city, another country, you take some of this advice. What you want to do is you want to do what everybody else is doing. You want to try to speak some type of the language, whether it's konnichiwa or bonjour, bonsoir, whether it's French, if it's English or Spanish, whatever it is. That's what I try to do to try to make sure that I wanted to blend in. I didn't speak their language. I let my game speak for, for myself. My, the way I played spoke volumes. But my whole purpose was I wanted to learn the language and because the communication wasn't there. And that, yes, I had an interpreter and needed um, an interpreter to make sure what I said was interpreted right. Now, from there, I let it go because I didn't, I didn't read kanji. I didn't read the newspapers every day here in Japan. But I needed an interpreter. It's called communications. You know, the little things, one word can mean a whole thing. And one thing can change. One word can change the whole thing. So, but Stephen, who is a, what we call in the U.S., a gas bag, who, that's his job to do that. He wasn't educated enough to do that. He's just trying to get on a topic and start controversy, which he did. Later apologized for, for it. So, you know, Otani does speak English. He made it in a press conference. He spoke English. 
Ichiro is going to probably speak English when he goes into the Hall of Fame. You know, these are key. Matsui speaks English well. It takes time. And these guys are willing to do that. Leon and Liron, they speak a little Japanese. Matt maybe speaks a little Japanese. If not, he's, I'm probably the one that speaks less Japanese, even though I got a little better about it. So, you know, that's what baseball does. You got nine different players, nine different countries playing on the same team. And when, it, when the game starts, it's a team. After the game, they go their little separate ways. So I got a guy from Atlanta. I got a guy from Japan. I got a guy from Dominican. We're all playing the same game. We all know how to play baseball. Three strikes, you're out. You come off the field, but only in Japan you have tie ball games. It's a little different in that situation. But my experience there, my interpreter went well. It was, and people accepted that in Japan here. And when you speak a little language and try to speak their language a little bit, it's being more appreciated. Leon or Matt? Any thoughts? Uh, myself, uh, on that topic of internationalizing the game, you know, I played in Japan for 10 years, uh, played with my brother uh, back in the earlier days when it, it wasn't as westernized as it, as it is now. And, and, you know, the expectations were high. Uh, I learned different things about Japanese culture. Uh, I opened myself up for for fans to to understand a little bit about my own culture. It really wasn't as much about the language as it is about the character and, and my teammates and learning how to, you know, baseball is kind of like throwing these guys will understand. Baseball is kind of an international language within itself. Um, but I think that when I first went over, heck, I even had a little Japanese girl rub my arm and, and see if my color rubbed off. And I, I thought it was a little bit of amusing thing. And it wasn't a malicious act. It was just something that people hadn't seen. You know, people weren't educated enough. And I think a lot of the differences in different cultures and different uh, uh, languages, uh, we learned different things and languages when we went to Japan, not only through our interpreter, but through understanding the culture that we were there. So it was kind of more of an international language of uh, understanding what we were doing, but we gave our character to the culture. You know, the, 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 the people, the fans that we were associated with were trying hard to understand what our culture was exactly the same way that we were trying to understand the culture of Japan. The language part came a little bit later. You know, we were learning different words from our teammates because our teammates were teaching us words at a time here and there. Um, the umpires, I remember Hiroko-san was trying to explain to me why our strike zone was a little bit wider than America because we were the big, strong Americans. And if the ball was thrown over the plate, then we would hit more home runs. And there was a sense of balance there. We didn't look at it. You know, some foreigners would come over and say, oh, the strike zone is too big. The umpires are cheating us. The culture is different. Well, to me, the beauty of it was the culture. And I think over the years as I've grown, I think the internationalization of all sports is the best thing that could ever happen to it. When Stephen A. Smith makes a statement like that about Shohei Otani, I think it's number one, I think it's short-sighted. I think he is, like Crow said, he's probably looking for controversy. But why apologize to it after you already know what you're going to say in the first place? To me, the beauty of a Shohei Otani is the fact that he does speak Japanese and he's an American showing his skills. To me, an interpreter is enough. Um, he'll learn English eventually because the longer you're in some place, you're going to naturally learn the language. I don't think it's that important that Shohei Otani speaks English because his teammates are going to be the ones that understand the, the English that he does speak. And they're going to learn a little Japanese in the meantime. So everybody wins. You know, and I think to make the issue over saying a person needs an interpreter, I don't, I don't see anything wrong. When you go to the Olympics, people are there from all over the world. They go home and they remember that international experience. They don't, they don't even think about the fact that they didn't speak the language there. They perform and they had a great experience and their act actions and the things that they did spoke volumes for what they accomplished. You know, when Matt Merton goes to Japan for the Hanshin Tigers, there's 60,000 people in the stands. 
there's probably 10,000 people there that, you know, may not like Matt Merton, but what does it matter? There are 50,000 people that love him and you can't please everybody in this game anyway. Me and Curl probably went through situations where the fans didn't appreciate us being a foreigners or maybe even African-Americans. But what, what difference does it make? Because we're out there to perform and play for the people that did appreciate it. So, you know, I have mixed feelings because to me, the language part is secondary to actual human beings enjoying the internationalization of this great game, especially baseball. Because I, I mean, I love it to death. I love people involved in it. If they're from a foreign country, I love it. I think it's the great experience in the world to hear somebody speaking Japanese. I think it's the greatest experience in the world to hear somebody speaking Hispanic or French or German or Russian. That's their language. They own it. I appreciate it. That's just my feeling. Well, I think I'm going to transition here a little bit, but um, in Japan, there's the word gaijin, which is literally outsider or someone from the outside. And you all ended up being gaijin, including Mr. Whiting, who's been there for a long time. And um, I know... <laughs> I know, Matt, you broke a Ichiro's record and that the Japanese people fans were often very protective of their their own people um, and their records. So I don't know, Matt, did you feel did you experience any um, blowback being Gaijin when you were approaching that record or. And just any yeah. other you know, experiences being Gaijin in Japan. Sure. So I, obviously I love hearing from these guys. They touched on so much when it comes to the culture already. Um, I do find the culture uh, component to be one of the most fascinating and uh, unique things about the game of baseball. Um, you know, when you think about the fact, I remember sitting there in Japan, looking around the table, uh, having uh, like a pregame meal and recognizing that I'm sitting here. Here's this dude, white, white guy with red hair from South Florida hanging out with a bunch of guys around a table um, from, you know, all over different parts of Japan and different parts of the world, Korea, Dominican Republic. And that experience was obviously true in the U.S. as well. And it's really cool because we all end up in the same spot, a lot of different backgrounds, a lot of different ways to get there, but we end up in the same spot, pulling on the same side of the rope, hopefully uh, in unison with one another for the same goal. So I just think that baseball um, in many ways is a beautiful picture uh, of what you would hope that, you know, the entire, our, our, our entire society or our world could be. Um, but we do, we have a commonality. It's kind of like a brotherhood. And so it's really cool. Um, and to attest to kind of what you mentioned there in regards to uh, the, the record, um, you know, I think one of the things with Japan um, being, a, being a little bit more closed off to the rest of the world um, for a long period of time, um, there is a lot of pride and um, co country, the, the country really gets behind um, their athletes and their people, which is awesome. Um, and I think that's one of the special things about Japan is that they are not um, uh, un unwilling to uh, adhere to something, right? And to hold a standard, um, which is really cool. Now, I do know that that manifested itself in a way when Osan um, on the home run side, I think there was a few different occasions there where there was a chance to break the home run record and there was talk about guys weren't being pitched to or whatnot. Um, I can't speak directly to those. Um, but when I was um, in 2010, when I was going to break the individual uh, season season hit record that Ichiro held, um, it was amazing. It was a, it was a compilation uh, of a lot of different people that had poured into me. It was my teammates uh, there in Japan. It was it was an amazing time period. I felt a lot of pressure and stress, to be honest with you. Um, I felt almost like I was going to be a failure if I didn't break it because uh, I was it was sitting right there at the cusp, uh, kind of at hand to be able to do. Um, but I will say that I never felt like they were necessarily pitching around me. Uh, they didn't make it easy, right? Um, they're looking to get you out. Um, they didn't make it easy. And I felt like none of those guys wanted to be the one to give up the hit. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I went for a game or so where I didn't really play to my potential. And I think I was trying to do more than I should have. And just a real quick note on that was it was a lot easier for me in the game, it was in Tokyo at Jingu Stadium, which has its highs and some very low lows for me in that stadium. Um, but uh, I was there with my team. We were fighting for a pennant. The bases were loaded. 
Um, it was my second at bat of the day. And I told myself, I said, you know what? My job right here is just to knock this guy in. And I tried to stay in the middle of the field and keep it simple and not try to get the hit that I had to get. And uh, it worked out. I was able to hit the change up up the middle for a base hit. And my focus coming off self to my team really helped me in that moment because it was unnatural for me to be thinking about myself and how I needed to get this hit. Um, I say all that because I never felt like the players there were intentionally trying to stop me. I did have it said to me a few times that they felt like, um, you know, and, I, and, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to hearing from these guys. Um, and we kind of talked about it before we came on tonight, just about how it was a different time period um, that I played in as compared to them. And maybe even for some of those guys that were trying to break the home run record, the game, uh, the world had already started getting smaller at that time. We had, uh, we had smartphones. Technology had really started to shrink it down. Um, Ichiro having had, I was, it was said to me that Ichiro having had success in the U.S., um, having broken the United States, the MLB single season hit record, I think that he did in 2003-04. Um, when he did that, it kind of opened the eyes of many Japanese to realize that if they're going to allow Ichiro to break this record, then maybe not that we're letting them break it, but that we're not going to purposefully stop them from doing it. Um, so I just think the world at that time had, had already started to get smaller. I think technology played a part of it. I think the success that Ichiro had stateside helped it. Um, but yeah, it was, uh, it was an amazing journey. The culture was awesome. Um, good. And I mean, there were some really great times. There were some tough times, but uh, no, I don't feel like at any point that it was, it was, purposefully I was stopped from being able to do that well on that note of being gaijin in Japan um do I think you all have some thoughts on uh what the differences of of baseball in Japan and I don't know uh Bob Whiting you want to come in and like tell us a little bit about your thoughts on that maybe these guys can um give the on-field but I'm, I am actually kind of curious how you became, how you started to write about baseball in Japan. And, and I know you have some thoughts about how baseball is quite different in Japan. Well, uh, okay. Just one thing about, you know, being a foreigner in Japan in the sixties, when I went there, the sixties and seventies, there were surveys that continually showed that 60% of the Japanese people did not want to associate with foreigners. And 40% did. And the nice thing about Japan is that people didn't want to associate with you. They left you alone. You know, they didn't try to beat you up when you were walking down the street. Mm -hmm. And so that left 40%. So in a city like Tokyo with 12 million people, that meant that you know, there were three or 4 million people who did want to associate with you. And it made things pretty nice. I became a fan of baseball in Japan because when I first went there, it was on television every night. The Omiri Giants games were televised nationwide every night from seven to nine. And uh, it, it was the only thing I could understand on TV is before I learned the language. And half the words they used were foreign derived words like strike, home run, auto, safe. <laughs> and uh, plus there were a couple of Americans on each team. So it, it piqued my interest. And so I became a fan and I learned to read Japanese by reading the sports papers every day. I'd pick up the Nikon sports and go to a coffee shop with my dictionary and try to read an article. So it helps to know if you have, a, if you have an interest in a subject, it helps to learn the language. And so when I moved back to New York, uh, I tried to tell people about Japan. Nobody was interested in my field, which was you know, Japanese politics. Nobody cared about the labor unions or the life of the South member. When I started telling them that they had a player named Sadaharu O who took nightly batting swings with the samurai sword, slicing strips of paper suspended from the ceiling in half, the people's interest picked up. They had a drill called the Thousand Fungo Drill. You had to feel ground balls for two and a half hours or until you dropped from exhaustion. It was a spirit strengthening drill. That sort of thing uh, piqued uh, people's interest. Baseball wasn't a spring and summer sport. It was a year-round sport. They grafted the, the principles of the martial arts onto baseball, endless training and development of spirit. 
And so that's how I wound up writing the chrysanthemum in the back to show the Japanese culture to baseball, which of course is uh, expressed in, in corporations and schools too, that same philosophy of complete dedication and self-sacrifice. So maybe Leon, Warren, and Matt can talk to those endless drills and some of the, well, how about some of the differences in the game itself too? Well, you know, myself, I did the thousand drill, the thousand ground ball drill. You know, I was, I was one of those um, guys early when my brother went over the year before me, he was the veteran player. He was a little bit older. I was a younger guy come over and, and if you guys read, and I know, uh, Mr. Whiting, those member Masaichi Kaneda, he was my manager and we were called the Lote running machine. And as a young player, they separated me from my older brother. So I went through all the things the Japanese did. Sometimes my brother would say, come on, Leon, you got to back out of there. You're going to be too tired before the season starts, blah, blah, blah. And I lost 22 pounds before opening day, but I did the thousand ground ball drill just because I wanted to see what it was like. I wanted to live the culture and I did it and I completed it. And I was so proud of myself that I did something that I'd never done before that it, it and when they talk about fighting spirit, I didn't really understand anything about what they talked about. Fighting spirit has got to be a little bit crazy. What's this about fighting spirit? Either you could hit it or throw it or catch it and run. And what's fighting spirit have to do with it? But when I completed it, I had a feeling of, I can do anything now. I can go out here and practice from sun up to sundown. The guys sometime after the, you know, Crow could relate to this back in the day, boy, after practice and spring training, how the running would happen. And I would jump right in there with these other young Japanese guys. And I would run those laps and we'd run from the baseball stadium back to the hotel. And I was right in there and they're going, this guy's, this is the craziest guy, Gene, we ever seen in our life. And I go, I just wanted to do it because I wanted to do it. It was just, this is what they do here. So I wanted to do it. I wanted to eat the raw fish. I wanted to eat the sushi. I want to eat the teriyaki. I want to eat whatever they eat. I'm going to eat it because I'm here. And, and this is where I am. And it's for me to really understand the culture, I can't go to the tourist spots. I have to live the culture in order to become acceptable in a way to my teammates, you know, the Marata Chojis and, he wrote that, and some of those guys on my team with Lote, they really embraced me, and they go, holy cow, Leon is out here. He's doing everything. You know, he's not backing out and saying, oh, that's too much running. Oh, that's crazy. We don't do that in the United States. Well, I wasn't in the United States. I, 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 I paid for it. I was tired, but at the same time, I was really proud of myself that I was able to do it, accomplish it, and then ended up third in a year and hitting my first year in Japan. And, and I don't even think Mr. Kaneda expected me. He expected it all from Leron, my brother, but I don't think he expected it from me. But I was like, don't tell me what I can't do. I'm going to get out here and do it. So that was, you know, being a crazy guy, Gene, really helped me acclimate myself to uh, Japanese baseball. Matt, Warren, anything else? Well, for me, um, yeah. <laughs> Coming to Japan, uh, and I heard about the, uh, the different styles and uh, the different uh, workout drills that they've had. I've seen the thousand hit drill. I never done the thousand hit hit drill. <laughs> I did do leap. I did do leapfrog in practice, which I think to till, to, still to this day, I don't think had anything to do with baseball. We were leapfrogging one another in warm ups. We had two a day practice. <laughs> yeah, we had two a day practice in the morning, and uh, we had practice at night. And I think the mo the biggest uh, change in as far as baseball from the way we always played it in America, growing up with it, is as you know, some of you might not know, they have tie ball games in Japan. And I remember coming off the at one game we're having at Karakuen, and we're coming off the field, and and I'm seeing my teammates grab their bats and head it. Everybody's turning around and heading toward the locker room. 
So I says, what, what the hell's going on here? I mean, I asked my interpreter, what the hell's going on? Where, where's everybody going? Uh, Kurumati sound. In Japan, 10, 945 is the last inning uh, we have to play. We're going to uh, end, in, end in a tie because everybody's got to take the last train home. And I stood there. I never forget. I stood there in total shock. There's no ties in baseball. Everybody, you got to play to win the game. Where is it? What the hell is this a tie? So it took me quite a while, step by step, two years maybe I asked myself, why? I find myself asking, why are they doing this way? Why are they doing it? So finally, my, my, my teammate, Reggie Smith, says, Crow, you got to stop asking yourself why. This is start changing your, your observations. Start changing where things used to be done. You're in a different culture. You're in a different land. They play the game different. Even the, It's called baseball rule. Some rules are the same here. So it's going to take you a little while here to do that. So I could either say the hell with this and going back home, like some Americans in the past have done, didn't want to accept the society or the practice or whatever it was. They packed their bags and they went home. I wanted to, I had to stay there. I wanted to stay there. And I was playing for Sadahara. I was playing for the best team in Japan, 50,000, 40,000 every night there. So I made it up in my mind to stop asking why. Once I did that, things start to make, I started to, to accept where I was. It took me a little while to do that, but it, it really did happen. So it, it, tie ball games was uh, one, one and leapfrogging, uh, warming up, leapfrogging, that type of thing. I, I didn't understand that rule, too, but it was part of something that I've seen, something that's part of what I've been through. And really, it, it's helped me be who I am today. It, it's helped me have this longevity that I have here in Japan because people know me now as a person that I've always a, was a team player and playing in Japan reinforced that for me, being a team player, what it meant to be a team player. Cause in the major leagues, there's a lot of selfish guys over there. There's a lot of guys play for themselves over there and don't know the meaning of team in Japan. There's a big T or team here. And I really appreciate that. Well, I think I'm, I'm going to start sneaking in some questions from the audience here. So Marcus is asking what the process is for an American player to be selected and si signed to play an MPB. And I don't know who the best person to answer that is. but hey, let, I think Matt can answer that one. Go ahead. All right. Matt. So. Yeah, for me personally, um, you know, this rule actually, I think it was kind of called the Kevin Millar rule. Um, he kind of changed things. Uh, in order for us, in order for us, and these guys can speak to it here uh, in regards to their experience, but in order for me to go over there, I was on the 40-man roster at the time with the Colorado Rockies. I got a phone call from Dan O'Dowd, who was the GM at the time of the team, of the club, and he said, hey, listen, there's some interest from Japan. And he goes, where are you at? Because essentially what he would have to do was, I had to sign a waiver that stated that uh, Dan O'Dowd and the Colorado Rockies are releasing me off of the roster for the opportunity to play in Japan. Okay. So they have to officially release you. So by signing that, that paperwork, you're basically telling all the other clubs in baseball that that's the purpose why the Rockies are, are, are putting you out there on waivers and you're not to accept that player off of waivers. So that happened because what I'm understanding is because of Kevin Millar, he was um, uh, being released. And at that time, the Boston Red Sox said, I'm not worried about necessarily, you know, there was no stipulation. The Boston Red Sox picked him up off of waivers. So instead of him going over to play in Japan, he ended up playing for the Red Sox. He's a part of that team that won the, the uh, World Series there. But so for us, we had to be released. We had to sign waivers to state why we were being released. And then at that moment, then we were able to engage the club in Japan. That's how we got it. But these guys, it may have been different because Millar, that came along after these guys had already had already been over there and played. Well, you know, on top of that, Rico, it's a lot of players and they approach us sometimes. They want to play in Japan because I think the perceptions that certain people have, the players over here, whether in A-ball or rookie league or playing independent ball, uh, Matt Burton obviously came from a 40 roster uh, situation with Colorado and most 
in, in order for an American player, I think, to succeed in Japan, uh, not every major league level player can succeed in Japan for whatever reason, their ability level. People underestimate the level of play that's played in Japan, and they have these perceptions that the level of play in Japan is not that strong. And I know there's players that they think that, that perform at that level. So they're not going to get players out of A ball or even double A ball. Most cases, they're going to get guys that are on the bubble, either minimum triple A with some major league experience or guys that are at the, you know, historically the end of their career in the major league level, because playing baseball in Japan is not easy. You know, you can see by the players that come over here in the United States. And I always say, I remember the year I had 41 home runs in 1980. And I came home and we were playing in this golf tournament and the major league manager for the California Angels said, hey, Leon, how many did you hit? And I hit, I hit 41 last year. Oh, all the ballparks are really tiny. And I don't play the fact that if you had 40 home runs in Japan and all the fences were short. And I think if I'm not mistaken now, the, short, the shorter fences are in America now, you know, more so than in Japan. So, and, and they underestimate the quality of the pitchers where you had, the Hideo Nomos, um, you had guys that were throwing, you know, the Makiharas, the Egawas, the, the, the Choji Maratas, the Yamadas, the Suzukis. I mean, these guys are 20 game winners, even in the United States. And so anybody just can't go play in Japan. So when people question, they say, hey, Leon, can you get me a contract in Japan? And they're playing in rookie ball. I go, it won't happen. The Japanese are not going to recruit or even go through the process that Matt mentioned of buying contracts because there's buyout clauses, there's situations where they, you know, uh, make these transactions happen to send a player to Japan, but they just don't send anybody. Um, okay, so then there's a question from Andrew that is asking, in the MPB, is there much friendly banter between the opposing players on the base path like there is in the um, MLB? I mean, I see some of those first basemen carrying on full conversations with the runners. Well, you, you may find, you may find some banter there with guys, uh, you know, the game's changed a little bit now. So, you know, some of these Japanese players, they want to speak a little English. They try to, to communicate with the foreign players. You see some banter there with the Latin ball players there when they get together on first base. And, you know, it's it's not a whole lot, but it's enough to break the ice as far as uh, communication is concerned. So it's come a long way. I think uh, that uh, the the effort on the Japanese ball players now are much better than it, than it ever was. Uh, these guys are speaking more English little by little or understanding a word or two. And communication is much better now than it was in the past. There's a story about Ichiro that came out in Mike Sweeney, the Kansas City Royals, who'd been in Japan, <clears throat> played with the Major League All-Stars, and if he got a hit, the announcer would say, Mike Sweeney, nice hitting, uh, Ichiro, nice batting. So Ichiro got a hit and went to first base, and Mike Sweeney's standing there, and he says, Ichiro, nice hitting. And Ichiro looks at Mike Sweeney and says, Mike Sweeney, nice ass. <laughs> 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 That's oh, good. Okay, Bob, I'm telling you. That's international understanding. That's communication. There you go. Okay, let's see. Um, Drew is asking, where will Japan end up in the Olympic podium? Anyone want to wager a guess on where Japan's team will end up in the Olympics? Well, I'm going to say I'm this. I mean, the... the they got a good ball club. Uh, they won't have uh, their top two pitchers uh, pitching in the Olympics this year. Uh, Sagano won't be pitching, and Singa, I don't think, be pitching for SoftBank and Sagano for the Giants. Um, but they're going to be bringing out their horses, too. I think this is maybe the best team the USA has ever had, led by uh, Frazier and Socha as, as managers. So, you know, Dominican has always been tough, too. They, uh, Sanchez and um, uh, CC Mercedes here, Tokyo Giants, they're going to be playing for a Dominican team. So as you as you heard before, there's not going to be any fans uh, in the stands. And that, that's really a lot of fuel, I think, is going to take away from the Japanese um, a little bit. Not much, but they're playing in their backyard. But, um, you know, it's all about pride. 
you know, they got their top players going on it. And, then, you know, they didn't play in 2008. And this may be the last time because next Olympic people, I think France, they're not going to have baseball. So there's a lot on the line here. I expect a good game um, uh, between both countries here. And uh, I hate to make a prediction right now, but it'd be a lot easier prediction for the Japanese if they had Sagano and Singer on this team. But I think I think uh, they're going to get they're going to get their money's worth from other other teams. I think Japan's going to win it. Like they won the World Baseball Classic. I think they were underestimated. I think there's something mm. to be said about because me managing over there, you know, in the United States, and I'll say this, they they want to try to rush the games up, Crow, and they go, okay, if we're going to walk a guy, let's put up four fingers and send the runner to first base. Mm. I think in Japan, if you put on a bunt sign in Japan, they ought to just say, okay, runner go to second, the batter's automatically out. <laughs> Save time because they know how to execute. In states now, we've gotten totally away from executing the situational part of the game. It's either home run power or strikeout. And the reason the Japanese won the first couple of uh, World Baseball Classics, I know at that time of the year in spring, we're protecting players, whatever. But the ja Japanese players know how to execute. I don't care if they talk about old school baseball or new school baseball. Baseball was designed to be played a certain way. And if you played in Japan, you understand they work really hard on execution, getting the bunch down, getting behind runners. And no matter where you go in the world and where in the world, the team that know how to execute the fundamentals of this game will win. And the Japanese proved it in the first two World Baseball Classics. And, you know, when I went to Japan in 2000 with the Chicago Cubs, when we opened up against the New York Mets, we played a couple of exhibition games, one against the Giants and one against the Cebu Lions. And our coaching staff, i never forget, Renee Latchman goes, man, we can sure learn a lot from the Japanese game because they know how to execute. We grew up learning how to play the game learning how to bunt, learning how to hit behind runners. In America now, we I think we've lost touch. And number one, we're not sending a major league club over there because we're not taking a time out for the Olympics, which I think should be, you take a lot of pride. It's only once every four years. I think Japan takes the type of pride in the game. They have ex extreme, I think they have superior players as far as execution is concerned they have speed they have power they have pitching even if you miss a couple of your top pitchers i still think japan is going to be the team to beat in the olympics that's just my feeling okay uh let's see i think maybe we can take one more question here um and we're getting down to the wire here so uh, there's a question from Jared. Are some of the Japanese teams more open to bringing in players from abroad than others? And is it more or less an equally adopted practice? Matt, why don't you take that one? I think there used to be a limit of foreign players on a Japanese team. I don't know if there still is, but. Used to be two, yeah. now it's a lot more. It's four. For you guys, hey, hey, for you guys, what was it, Warren, Leon, what did you guys uh, have? It, it was it it was two it was two I, I think it's four now it is it's, it's four now but it it was only two and um, you know I I hate to think about Matt you know where would Japanese baseball be without the foreign input how much power they bring how much a different attitude they bring the speed the power that they bring look we're not as fundamentally sound as the Japanese I don't think. Some of these ball players over there know how to punt or lay down a punt. Uh, it's all about power. It's all about striking out. But um, yeah, it was. Uh, it's it's a different style of play, and you saw that when you got there, right, Matt? Yeah, for sure. Um, for us, it was four. There was four foreigners when I first got there. It was four Americans. Um, by the time I left, it was uh, there were two Americans on the big league club. Uh, a guy from Korea, Osan, and then um, Gomez uh son who was from the dominican republic so you know it's four foreigners and you know you think of foreigners it's basically anybody who's non-japanese non-blood um four four players allowed to be on that club now you can have more that are in the minor league system um how they go about that every club goes about it a little differently some some teams have more willingness today and again i can't speak to time period when they were there to stockpile a lot more foreigners um to have them at the ready in nigun 
so that if they want to move guys up and down, they can do that more readily. Um, some teams uh, simplify that that player pool down and kind of keep it about those, you know, maybe four or five, six guys. Um, some of those guys down there in the minor leagues are more developmental. Um, so it just depends. Each club will tackle that differently. And then the other thing that's really unique about Japan as compared to the United States is that a lot of time, even the pay structure is distinctly different from one club to another. So a lot of times uh, when you look in the United States, everything's about comps against your, um, against your class. Everything's about uh, your, how you stack up against the guys at the same service time and age as you do. Um, in, in Japan, it's, it's a little bit more um, based upon what each individual club deems as appropriate. So you could play for one of the major clubs that really does well financially and, and have a similar performance to a team that maybe doesn't do quite as well financially and get paid distinctly differently. So I think there's a lot of, there's a lot of things uh, at play in Japan, and I definitely think that it's tackled differently from club to club, for sure. Now, isn't they have a rule that if you play there two years, Robert, that they could declare a national, that they could actually bring an extra foreigner over? Is that, is that correct? Like if you play there two years, you're considered – kind of a national or Japanese, and then you can go back and get another foreigner. Because I, I was thinking there were some clubs over there that had more than four players on no, the No, it's longer than that. It's like 10 yeah, years. Yeah, seven. I think, it's, I think it's seven or eight years. Eight years. Eight, yeah, eight okay. years. To be, it, that, that qualifies so they can keep you there and keep you on the bench, whatever like that. But that's a long time. It's that's eight, a long years. Time. eight yeah. years. Okay, all right. All right. I, right I, I miss sure. it's eight years. Okay, okay, Trevor okay. Trevor chatted in a comment that says you can be a foreigner but registered as a Japanese if you are drafted by a Japanese team, which requires you to have attended high school or college in Japan. Right. Generally speaking, um, Daikan Yo, Taiwanese player, is an example of this. So I guess mm. if you're American, but if you went to high school or college in Japan, then. Okay, okay. I, I thought I heard something about that. Yeah. Okay. Oh, well, and then Trevor, Trevor, is saying, Trevor is saying it's that it's eight years that you have to be. Right. Eight and years. Vladimir Balentin of the Hawks achieved the status. Right. Valentine. Valentin. Yes. One of my teammates over there did as well. Randy Messenger. Um, he, he was able to get, I think, to the eight, eight year mark, I believe. Um, and that was my argument for myself. I got six in. These guys did longer. I was always like, man, if I could have just, if you could have just rode me out for another year or two, you'd have had a, had a free player over there, you know? <laughs> um, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it is, it's tough. I mean, these guys are a testament to that. I want to say one thing really quickly. I, I do think that it's important to recognize, I mean, talent certainly is a big part of it. I think that's been mentioned um, in your ability to go over there and play, but if nothing more, what we hear is the fact that you have to be willing to embrace culture. And so yes. wherever it is that your feet are at, you have to be willing to do that. And I think that that transcends going to the Japan or Japan coming to the U.S. or anywhere else for that matter. It's, it's just a matter of us being, you know, look, at the end of the day, recognize the abilities and talents that we've been blessed with. Um, certainly um, do not forget who you are, right? Um, but with that, be willing to embrace culture. We'll be willing to embrace where you're at. And, and so uh, just listening to these guys has been fun. But um, the culture piece I don't think can be missed. It's so important. And uh, a big part of the success of these guys and being able to stay over there as long as they did was their willingness to accept that, which is cool. You know, the only, the only uh, complaint I have after 10 years, see, I was, I was told, me and my brother, Leron played there 11 years, I played there 10 years. And we thought we were gonna qualify for a pension <laughs> <laughs> and it, I think we heard something, Robert. We said, "Oh, a foreign player after ten years, you qualify for a pension." Well, in our eight, my eighth year, my brother's ninth year, it was like, "Well, it, that rule may have changed." So he got to eleven, I got to ten, and I think we were paying. I don't know about you, Carl. I think we were paying into our association dues. We were paying out of all of our checks into it, but we never got a pension. So maybe I ought to fly back over and get with Robert. And get my pension back. Well, you didn't. Miss, you didn't miss much because their pensions are nowhere near what they are in the states. Oh, I agree. I'm just bringing it up. It's all. It's all in fun. But, but I was. I was kind of bragging over longevity. You know that. Um, you know, me and my brother did. We played there a long time. Boomer Wells played there a long time. You know, I think Randy and and uh, 
Crow, you and, and Matt too. I think you guys were there six years, right? Seven. And yeah, uh, I was there seven there years. Too. And Scott Matheson uh, uh, for the Giants pitcher, he did about not eight nine years. Scott, he did. Yeah. Yeah, Tuffy's the longest, right? Tuffy Rose. Yeah, T Tuffy's forever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, it's been a fun discussion and we can certainly keep this up for many hours, but I think we're a few minutes over our time limit. So I'm going to say thank you to everyone. Thank you to all the panelists and thank you to Japan Society. And I'm now going to hand it over to Dr. Joshua Walker of the Japan Society. Thank you so much, uh, Yuriko and everyone. I just want to just say thank you. I've been listening this entire time. Uh, it is always uh, at Japan Society. We try to end on time. But when you have a conversation like this, we could have gone for another couple hours. I, would have, I just love the camaraderie and uh, just the, the comments. I really appreciated Matt's last comment about the importance of culture, which is exactly what we're doing at uh, Japan Society, trying to bring the U.S. and Japan together. I think we had a timely discussion tonight. Uh, couldn't have been time better with Otani in the news for the All-Star. And as uh, the predictions we've already heard, uh, Japan playing uh, in the Olympics in the next nine days. Uh, I want to thank Yuriko. I want to thank Warren. I want to thank Leon San and Matt and Robert San as well for all of you joining. And I want to thank our institutional partners, the Japan American societies around uh, the different places, especially uh, to our, our friends in Chicago and Cincinnati, Dallas, Fort Worth, and then Kentucky as well. I just want to give you a few points of what's coming up. We're really excited about our film series that really connects uh, the best of Japanese film. Uh, we're going to be coming back for the 15th uh, annual uh, Japan Cuts. We pushed it a little bit this year because of the Olympics, but we're going to have a lot of that in-person programming you're used to here in New York. But for those of you not in New York, fear not. It's going to be streaming live uh, from August 20th to September 2nd as well. There's some great films available right now as well. If you go to japansociety.org, that's my job to make sure you guys go there. I hope we continue to have conversations like this and see the power of uh, sports diplomacy clearly as we get ready to celebrate 150 years next year uh, and the great uh, diamond diplomacy that we're all excited to see. I can't wait to welcome you all back to Japan Society. So wherever you are in the world, whether it's there in, in Tokyo, uh, Ohio gozaimasu to all of you. Thank you again uh, for joining us. I hope we get a chance uh, to connect again. Thank you again and good night from here in New York and Ohio gozaimasu to all you in Tokyo and beyond.